We're glad to have Eric Jones back with us, he and his wife, Missy. He'll be, he's agreed to lead us through July, and so we're very thankful for that. Uh, so Eric, welcome again, Missy. Thank you for being here. Leadership guru Peter Drucker is often quoted as saying, the four hardest jobs in America are the President of the United States, a university president, a CEO of a hospital, and a pastor. <laughs> That's right, a pastor. Roll your eyes if you want, but pastoring is not as easy as it looks. A few years ago, I was waiting in my cart to start the afternoon flight of the Wounded Warrior Golf Tournament up in the village. I overheard a guy in the next cart go off on pastors. The man's partner said he had heard that in the morning flight that a pastor won the longest drive contest. Well, that's all it took to set this man off. I'm not surprised, he said. Pastors don't do a blankety-blank thing. All they do is write one little sermon a week, do nothing the rest of the time, and get paid a six-figure salary. No wonder he hit a good shot. Pastors can play all the golf they want. Now, I can take a joke. And we pastors do bring some of this on ourselves. But this was no joke. The guy hates pastors. Probably has his reasons. Still, his comments pushed my buttons. And I wanted to leap from my cart, grab that little man by his collar, and talk to him like God talked to Job. <laughs> Listen, Jack, do you know any pastors personally? Have you ever walked in a pastor's shoes? Do you know what it's like? to try to say something fresh to a congregation not once a week but at least twice and sometimes three or four times a week with those little sermons you rant about? Does your job keep you up to your neck in death and dying, leading funerals for friend after friend after friend after friend, needing to stuff your own grief so you can help the families that are grieving? Answer me if you know. Have you ever led a large organization that runs primarily on the backs of volunteers and is funded through the uncoerced giving of willing people? Does your family live in a fishbowl knowing that people watch your lives intently, hold you to a higher standard, and if you stray even a little bit, some will call you a hypocrite and others will call for your job? Have you ever spent so much time trying to rescue broken families that you put your own family at risk? How do you answer these questions, little man? Do you have to deal with being put on a pedestal you do not want and wrestle with the fact that people think you are a much better man than you are? Do you ever worry in your job that, God, that you will get glory that belongs only to God? Do you regularly have people ask you life's most difficult questions, expect definitive answers, and are disappointed uh, when you don't? Is eternity at stake in what you do for a living? Do you often work weeks at a time without a full day off? Well, do you, punk? <laughs> I'm sorry, stuff like that not only brings out my inner God to Job, it brings out my inner Clint Eastwood. <laughs> and that's what I wanted to say, but I didn't say it because it was Monday afternoon, I am a pastor, I get paid more than I deserved, and I was on the golf course. That alone would have confirmed everything the guy thinks about pastors. Unless he could see me play, or unless he could spend a week or two in my shoes, and not just my shoes, but the shoes of many pastors I know. Today we begin a four sermon series called So You're Looking for a Pastor. I invite you to open your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. As you know, we're looking for a pastor. Seems like a good time to do a little teaching on what the Bible says about a pastor and his work. But before we talk about his work, we need to talk about his life. Several weeks ago, you received a survey from our pastor search committee essentially asking you what do you, are you looking for in a pastor? And if, and if we were to ask God that question, God would point us to our text today. The Bible doesn't speak volumes about pastors, but it speaks some. 
mostly in these three letters that Paul writes to his pastoral protégés, Timothy and Titus. Paul wrote these letters to help these young pastors manage issues in their churches. Paul speaks some about the pastor's work and some about his character. A pastor's work is challenging. Maintaining a pastor's character is harder. Character is foundational. And so Paul begins here. I invite you to hear the word of the Lord through the Apostle Paul. This saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires a noble work. An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. He must manage his own household competently and have his children under control with all dignity. If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? He must not be a new convert, or he might become conceited and incur the same condemnation as the devil. Furthermore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders so that he does not fall into disgrace in the devil's traps. The word of the Lord. There were lots of devil's traps in Ephesus where Timothy served as a pastor. Hard enough to do church in the hometown of, of the beloved pagan goddess Artemis, but there are problems in the church too. False teachers stirring up trouble. Worship is a bit of a mess. Some are wanting to lead who are unqualified to lead. There's confusion about how to take care of the widows. Timothy is drawing some fire. You're too young to be our pastor. And greed is creeping into the church. Lots of troubles. Timothy needs help. He needs Paul's counsel. And he needs more hands on deck to help him pastor this network of house churches scattered around the city. So our text helped Timothy know what to look for in a pastor, and it helps us in the same way. Notice in verse 1 that being a pastor is noble work. On balance, its blessings far outweigh its burdens. The saying is trustworthy, writes Paul. If anyone aspires to be an overseer, a pastor, he desires a noble work. Hard to know what Paul means by aspiring to pastoral work. Usually pastors were appointed to the office by apostles like Paul. Because the focus in verse 1 is more on position than the person, Paul appears to be saying the position of overseer is such a significant matter that it should indeed be the kind of work to which a person would aspire to study God's word, preach and teach God's message to God's people, to be invited into people's lives in their highest highs, their lowest lows, and to walk alongside them through the, through the plateaus of life, to mobilize a church for the kingdom, to impact eternity day by day by day. It's noble work. It's worthy of aspiration. But pastors don't volunteer. God calls them. According to the Gospels, Jesus' 12 disciples didn't volunteer. They didn't show up for a job interview. Jesus called them. Follow me, he said, and they followed. Paul didn't volunteer to be an apostle to the Gentiles. Jesus met him on the Damascus Road, called him to the task, and Paul did it. Neither the disciples nor Paul aspired to be anything than what they were at the time. Fisherman, a tax collector, a terrorist to the church. Jesus' call changed that, but we can say this, when called, they aspired to be the best pastors they could be. Now, my own story is similar. I graduated from high school. I was set to attend the University of Arkansas in the fall. I wasn't sure what I was going to do for a career, but ministry never occurred to me until a preacher at a church camp that June said, I believe God is calling somebody in this room to be a pastor and those words were no more out of his mouth than the words of God were in my ears and in my heart. He's talking about you, John. I am calling you. I didn't aspire to be a pastor. I wasn't opposed to it, just hadn't considered it. The Lord calls his pastors directly or he calls us through the words of others. He used a preacher's words to call me. And I'm praying that God will use my words today to call any of you that he wants to serve him in vocational ministry. And if he calls, 
I pray that you will aspire to do this noble work. But before we turn our attention to the work, we need to pay attention to the pastor's character. Verses two through seven in our text tell us the kind of character that God expects in a pastor. Pastors need character. There's been something, hasn't there, of an epidemic these last few years of pastors who've lost their ministries to moral failure of some kind or another. In the Southern, Southern Baptist life, it's been especially because of sexual abuse among Baptist clergy. And, and, and many of those pastors who were caught in those actions were actually doing pretty solid pastoral work otherwise. See, that's why character trumps performance. Paul makes that clear in our text. You'll notice that Paul is not offering a job description here. He's offering a character description. The title overseer is all the job description we get in this text. Overseer means a person who keeps the broad view of the organization in mind, a person who looks at things as a whole, at the big picture. He coordinates, manages the organization. Overseer is one of three New Testament words that are used for the leader of a local church. The other titles, other words are, they're, they're overseer, elder, and pastor. Now it's tempting to differentiate these terms, to nuance them, and some do, but Baptists historically view these terms as synonymous because they are used interchangeably in the New Testament, which means pastors wear a lot of hats. William Willimon explains that the pastoral ministry requires a wide range of sophisticated skills, public speaking, intellectual ability, relational gifts, self-knowledge, theological understanding, verbal dexterity, management acumen, sweeping floors, moving folding chairs, serving as a moral exemplar, and all the rest. No wonder, Williman writes, failure is always crouching at the door. But, it, but a job description is not Paul's primary purpose. In this text, character description is. Character is foundational, it's that inner disposition that always shows itself in outward behavior. It's who we are, as someone said, when nobody's paying attention. A person can hide flawed character for a, a while, but sooner or later, it, it shows up. Paul calls church leaders to high character, and not just pastors. Based on Paul's counsel in all of his other letters, he doesn't create this two-tiered system of Christian behavior in the church. One for, for church leaders, pastors, and, and one for the rest of the believers in the congregation. Paul writes about the character of all believers in the church. He only specifies the character of pastors in these pastoral epistles. So, so I want you to listen to this character list for yourself. It's a worthy measuring stick for every follower of Jesus. The first trait, above reproach. That doesn't mean the pastor is without sin. It means he's morally careful and morally responsible. Pastors cultivate holiness in their lives, although none of us ever get there completely. In seeking to live above reproach, the pastor tries to live a life that neither embarrasses him nor his congregation. One of the side soul blessings of this requirement is that it keeps pastors humble, keeps us aware of our character sins, our character shortcomings. At one point in the career of St. John Vianney, who was an uneducated, zealous rural priest in France, several of his congregations circulated a petition declaring him unfit to hold the post. And when at last the priest was able to get his hands on the petition, he signed it. See, living above reproach doesn't mean sinless perfection, but it implies virtuous and exemplary behavior. To use one of my life mottos, be an example, not an excuse. A pastor should live above reproach. The character traits that follow show a pastor how to do that. Look at the next one. The husband of one wife. The most difficult one of these traits to interpret. It's not hard to translate man of one woman or one woman man. Now this doesn't require that a pastor must be married. Paul wasn't married. So far as we know, Pastor Timothy was not married either. It does require that if a pastor is married, he needs to be the husband of one wife. But what does that mean? Some say, well, he's writing about divorce. Is he? 
Is Paul saying if you've, if you've been divorced, you can't be a pastor, period? That's doubtful. Paul knows the language. He could have written, no divorced pastors allowed. But he didn't. He could mean married only once. He could mean faithful to his wife. I believe Paul means that the pastor must be committed and faithful to his wife in a stable, happy marriage. A good marriage is more vital to a pastor than some long past divorce. A pastor in a bad marriage will have a harder time focusing on his work. He'll have less credibility when he tries to help other troubled families in the church and he may be more tempted to have a wandering eye toward other women. The husband of one wife. If a pastor is married, he needs to maintain a healthy marriage. The next character is self-controlled. Sometimes that's translated temperate. Self-controlled, it could refer to, to the use of wine, but I think it means temperance on a broader scale. It means a pastor is not given to extremes. He's not up one day and down the next. He's not hot one day and cold the next. He's more of a reliable, dependable, steady eddy, self-controlled for the long haul. Next is sensible. That means the pastor keeps his balance and he manages his passions in wholesome ways, sensible, the pastor must be respectable, a person worthy of respect, as opposed to the kind of person, you know people like this, who elicits a grimace or an eye roll when his name is mentioned. Oh, him. Respectable. Next, Paul lists hospitable. Amid the miserable travel conditions of the first century, hospitality was important. A willingness to open one's home to another, to the stranger. It's the spirit of Mikasa, Sukasa, my house, it's your house. It's a virtue for all Christians, especially those who oversee the church. Hospitality. Then the pastor must be able to teach. Now on the surface, that sounds more like function than character. But is it? I mean, a pastor needs to know his stuff. Needs to cap capably teach the truth of the gospel and of the scripture. Finding, his func finding this function, though, amid this description of character reminds us that we teach by life as well as by word. So maybe we could put it this way. Pastors should not be hypocrites, as Jesus sometimes called the religious leaders in Israel. Pastors should practice what they preach. Next, not an excessive drinker. Cheers to that. An addictive personality is not healthy for somebody who cares for souls. That's the point. What do addicts do? They tend to use people to meet their own needs. They tend to be deceitful and try to cover up their addiction. And excessive drinking leads a drinker to lose control and to fall under the influence of things other than Jesus Christ. Now this is not an absolute prohibition. It's not a call that pastors must totally abstain from alcohol. In, later in this book, in chapter 5, verse 23, Paul instructs Timothy to use a little wine for your stomach and for your frequent illnesses. But even that instruction applies to the medicinal use of alcohol rather than plain old social drinking. In our addictive culture, I think it's wise for pastors to avoid drinking at all. That's been my practice, my whole ministry. Now, I don't throw stones at pastors who enjoy an occasional beer or a glass of wine with supper, but more than one drink could quickly become excessive drinking. Next, Paul strings together three character traits that are opposite the behavior of the false teachers that Timothy had to deal with in Ephesus. Not a bully, but gentle. Not quarrelsome not greedy. Pastors are to treat people gently and not be bullies who use their position or their power to snipe at people, intimidate people, or berate people. And pastors aren't quarrelsome either. Nobody likes a pastor who wants to fight about everything. Early in my ministry, a pastor said, told me, an older pastor said, pick your battles carefully. Most things are not worth disrupting the unity in the church over. When pastors pick unnecessary fights, 
They, they are throwing a hand grenade into unity, gospel relationships, the church's joy and evangelism. They blow it all up. Contentious people have no business being in the pastorate. Nor do greedy people, Paul says. Pastors need to learn how to be content with what God provides instead of always looking for more. Unlike the false teachers of Timothy's day, pastors are to treat people kindly, wage peace, and are never for sale. Well, Paul gets back to family matters next. He must manage his own household competently and have his children under control with all dignity. And then parenthetically, he says, if anyone doesn't know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? The pastor's management of the home is comparable to caring for the church. Notice that the pastor is not called to manage the church, but to take care of it. Management includes caring, caring includes management. But Paul's emphasis seems to be on caring for the church. A well-managed family enables a pastor to care well for the church. Obviously, if a minister's family is in turmoil, his ministry focus is difficult. The pastor can then become an easy target for people who want to criticize and ridicule and diminish his ministry by pointing to his family that's in trouble. Every pastor I, I know will tell you that if the family's not all in, ministry is way harder. And, and if the pastor ignores his family for the sake of his ministry, his family will suffer and his ministry will too. A pastor's ministry starts at home. And churches need to encourage their pastors in this. I remember my first mission banquet here in the fall of 1995. I'd been your pastor about five months. And the annual mission banquet, which has always been a big deal at this church, was scheduled for a Monday night. Keith Parks, who at that time was the president of the International Mission Board, it might have still been the Foreign Mission Board then, I don't know. He was our speaker. But my son, the 10th grader, had a JV football game that night, and our son had a lot of trouble with this move, a lot of issues with this move. So I felt like, you know, I need to be at his game instead of at the banquet. I wanted to be at both, but I chose to be at his game. Now, I was new to the church. I honestly had no idea how much flack I was going to take and suffer for that choice. But, you know, the only comment I got for missing the, the banquet was from uh, Don Slayton. He said, when I heard you missed the banquet to attend your son's football game, that told me all I needed to know about you. Thank you for taking care of your family and for reminding us parents to do the same. I've not always managed my family well. I've been too absent. I've been more married to the church than I have to my family. But on balance, thanks to Dana and the Lord, our family's been a plus for our ministry, not a liability. And we give thanks now that even in their 40s, our children love Jesus and love the church and are raising their kids to do the same. Pastors are called to manage their families well. <laughs> or at least have a, have a wife who can. <laughs> Next, Paul lists not be a new convert. Why, why this? Maybe because though a pastor takes his share of criticism, pastoring can also be a heady thing. People telling you how good you are, and how much that sermon meant to them, how they'd never gotten through that trouble if you, you hadn't been there for them. It's heady stuff. So a pastor needs some seasoning. He, he, he needs to have been a believer long enough to know that he's nothing and Jesus is everything. Lest he get too full of himself and like Paul says, become conceited. Become almost like the devil. See, that happens. Trust me, there is as much pride in a room full of pastors as there is in a room full of doctors or lawyers or politicians. Well, maybe not politicians, but the others, for sure. <laughs> and pride is the mother of so many sins. 
Conceit is what led the devil to rebel against God and want to be like God. And so a pastor needs some seasoning before he steps into the role of pastor. If he has success, it's tempting to make it all about himself instead of making about Christ. And it's easy to think he's some kind of super Christian or expert pastor or he might even develop a Messiah complex. And that sets him up for a fall as he longs for the glory that only belongs to God and the church gets wounded in the process. Seasoned Christians, they've walked through enough failures that they're more aware of their sin and their need for Jesus than recent converts sometimes are. They'll get there, it just takes a while. Finally, Paul writes that pastors must have good reputation among outsiders so they don't fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. This is not a call to join the Rotary Club. But it is a call for a pastor to live a life consistent with his profession. That often comes into play in a pastor's business and financial dealings. Like pastors who do not pay their bills on time. Or who are always looking for a free lunch. Or who, who, who ask merchants about a professional discount. Or some kind of favored status. It could also refer to pastors who are bad neighbors, who yell at their children's teachers at school when they don't feel like their kids are getting treated fairly, or who act like jerks every time they're out at the ball field. Behavior like that makes for a bad reputation with outsiders. So, so this part of the trait, the character, is about life in the community. Pastors are not monks. We don't live in the church. We work in the church as we live in the world. Paul says pastors need to live in the community in such a way that they don't disgrace themselves, hurt the church in the eyes of potential converts and fall into the trap of the devil who is always on the prowl looking for ways to make the pastor in the church look bad. So Paul lays out this strong description of character of a pastor. Now I ask you, who can live up to this? Been a little afraid to preach this, lest after this sermon you decide, I don't measure up and show me the door before January. <laughs> there is only one crucified, resurrected Christ. Only one. Only one Lord, one King, one head of the church. And it's not this pastor or any pastor. But Jesus is with the pastor and provides the grace and the strength and the Holy Spirit power to grow that pastor into the character that Paul describes in our text. I learned some years ago when we were looking to call new pastors to the staff, I needed to focus on four C's. Calling, character, competency, and chemistry. All matter, but the most important is character. No matter how good bad actors perform, no matter how popular they might seem in the early, early days of their ministry, their bad character will eventually show through and it will sabotage their ministry. They may have all the right doctrine when they teach, but their lifestyle is a false teaching of gospel behavior. We cannot separate a pastor from his character you don't cut slack saying, well, he's so good at this or that, but yeah, his character's a little iffy. Good character lends credibility. It lends power to a pastor's ministry. A pastor's bad character makes it hard for anybody to take him seriously and makes it impossible to trust him. And if you can't trust your pastor, he's no longer your pastor. Your deeds are so loud. I can't hear what you say. In a culture that's impressed with flash and splash and dash, with smoke and lights and cuteness and cleverness and coolness, churches need to keep coming back to this text. As they call, like we're in the process of doing, and as they evaluate their pastors. And we need to think through this text as we look for our next pastor. Richard Lisher nailed it. Was that agreement, Lord, or was that? Uh... <laughs> Richard Lisher nailed it when he observed, 
But in the last analysis, the pastoral character humbly offers itself as a paradigm for the service, worship, and witness to God that belongs to all believers. It's not better performances the churches need, but truer characters. Lord Jesus, make this so in the pastors that we have now and in the pastor that you're preparing to lead this church into the future. Amen. I invite you this morning to respond to the gospel. Say, where's the gospel in there? Well, here's where the gospel is in that text. You cannot ever get to this character level without Christ. We need Christ. We need him to save us from our sins, to fashion us, sanctify us, to become the people he wants us to be, the person he wants you to be. I invite you today, if you don't know Christ, to throw open your heart to him and ask him to to save you from your sins and give you life. I invite you, Christian, to to put your life up against this up against this character list. How do you measure up? Where do you come short? What do you need to ask Christ to help change and modify and produce in your character? I invite you to come join the church if God puts that on your heart. Um, I've been really encouraged the last several weeks we've been people joining almost every Sunday in one or both of the services. It's always a fear when a pastor you know, announces a retirement. He said, well, I think I'm just gonna wait for the next guy, see what I think of him. I get that, but uh, just a quick reminder, we've been here since 1836. We ain't going anywhere. So I encourage you to just hang in there and be a part of this congregation if God's calling you to be here and be a part of us. I want you also in this time to pray for our pastors on the staff that will live into this character and to pray for the next pastor that God's preparing to bring here, that he also will exhibit this character in his life and ministry. Let's stand together as we sing. Uh, Ministers will be at the front to respond. If you're online, you can text the word ACTION to 94000 and register anything God's doing in your life there.